We're very excited to welcome with Martin Torgoff. Uh, He's the author of several books on American art, politics, and popular culture, and an award-winning award -winning filmmaker behind Emmy Award-nominated documentaries like VH1's Planet Rock and The Drug Years. And we're very excited to have him here to discuss his brand new book, Bop Apocalypse, Jazz, Race, the Beats, and Drugs, um, with John Titel, uh, Queens College professor of English and Pulitzer Prize-nominated author of Ezra Pound, The Solitary Volcano, among other books. So without further ado, please join me again in welcoming uh, John and Mark, uh, Martin to the Wow, thanks for coming out on this dank night. I, it, it's just great to see you. Um, I'd like to thank uh, John Titel for coming uh, and being willing to discuss my book and this subject. Um, it, John is the preeminent scholar on the Beat Generation. And he wrote a classic work called Naked Angels, which was really the first significant book. It's a touchstone. Uh, about the Beat Generation. And um, I, it's really an honor to have him. Thank you, John. And uh, without any further ado, I'd also like to um, thank my wife, my lovely wife, Laura. Yeah, It's not easy being married to a writer, especially these days, especially this writer. <laughs> and thank you for all of your love and support, honey. Uh, cool, okay, let's get going. Um, I, just before I read, I'm gonna read a vignette, a short vignette from the chapter called um, Round Midnight. And um, this book, um, uh, this, those of you who uh, read my last book know that it was the story of how drugs went from the underground to the mainstream in American culture and how that changed the landscape. This book is really the story of the underground itself, where it all came from, how it first entered the DNA of our culture. And as such, it's largely the story of the evolution of jazz and its relationship to the beat generation these writers who were enormously influenced by that art form and incorporated it into their own breakthrough works. And um, this, um, this thing I'm gonna read is set in uh, the spring of 1956. It's about Miles Davis and his group, the, the great Miles Davis Quintet. At the time, Miles has just come out of uh, 40 years of heroin addiction and um, it's been about a decade since the mid-40s when heroin first entered the jazz scene. And um, it's been raging there and raging uptown in Harlem. And um, this is just um, a little snapshot of um, kind of where things were at at that particular time. So you alluded to William Burroughs who certainly knew a thing or two about heroin. <laughs> you could say that. You know, Junkie had published Junkie um, before this scene takes place. Three years earlier. Mm -hmm. And that was the book in which he used the phrase, the algebra of need. And I don't think that anyone's ever come up with anything that kind of describes heroin addiction, what actually happens better than that since. Well, you know, the amazing thing about Junkie was that in American literature or world literature, it was basically unprecedented. And you know, it's so laid back and unsensational, but real. You know, it's, what, it's what's on the end of your fork, as William would have said. Uh, uh, scary in a way, but not sensationalized in the way that Aldrin did with, uh, you know, The Man with the Golden Arm. It's kind of more like a documentary yeah. uh, mixed with a film noir. Yeah. And I think that that was something that Burroughs had hit upon that he would kind of take into the writing of Naked Lunch, which is actually happening around while all of this is going on. He's a very cinematic writer, and you really see it in Naked Lunch. Right. right. And, and, and 
actually, I think Cronenberg's film does some justice uh, 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 to the novel. I mean, it just gets a slice of it because it's so complicated and so kaleidoscopic, but his sensibility is, is good. I love the film. Um, anytime an artist takes a whack at something like that, it's laudable. Oh yeah, just the attempt, I agree. And, um, but I, I think it was, it was largely successful. Yeah, I particularly remember the sequence of the talking asshole. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which was an exact visualization, his visualization of what Burroughs had written about. And Th that piece, by the way, is the beginning of Naked Lunch. That was the first routine that he sends to Ginsburg in New York, and that he keeps sending them, and they amalgamate in the end. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing about the relationship of jazz and the beat writers was that what Burroughs took from jazz, it seems to me, was kind of different from what Allen and Jack Kerouac took. Oh, yeah. Those guys actually incorporated the sensibility, the conceptualization of playing jazz into the writing um, of On the Road and Howl and other works. And Visions of Cody. Yes, Visions of Cody. And, um, but I think what Burroughs took was the language of the hipster. Oh, yeah. And um, that, I think that was what he took from jazz. Well, he's a, he even has a glossary, at, <laughs> in, in, you know, at the end of Junkie. You know, who, who can imagine a glossary in a novel? You, know, you, need a, you mean there's a code here? And indeed there is. Yeah. Um, the thing about Junkie that also like, really struck me was, um, in addition to being a documentary, it was also kind of a how-to manual. Right. If you were interested in drugs and read that book in the 1950s, you were going to learn everything you possibly needed to know about how to do them and where to get them. And nothing like that had ever been published. You know, uh, what you said a, a moment earlier, that uh, uh, the relationship of Kerouac and Ginsburg to jazz was quite different from Burroughs. Uh, Alan told me uh, that for him, what was formative was his mad mother, Naomi, who would play Bessie Smith on a scratch record all day. Well, you know. <laughs> so when you say in your book that, you know, he, he was reading Mesereau's Really the Blues in 1946 while he was a student at Columbia as if it were, quote, the Rosetta Stone, which is a nice way to put it, <laughs> uh, 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 you can see that with uh, uh, Alan growing up, it was an important part of his life, as it was for his, not only his mom but his dad, both of them, uh, uh, were particularly in the blues. Um, uh, uh, with Kerouac, the initiation is, I think, even more profound. Because yeah. he's there at the birth of Bob in Minton's. Right, right. You know, night after night. In fact, Kerouac set a record cutting classes at Columbia. Because if you're uh, going to an after hours club with Lester Young, uh, uh, how, do you, how do you make Lionel Trilling's 9 o'clock class? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, he was getting an education of a very different kind. Um, there's a moment in my book that I think is like really pivotal. And it's when, the, it's the first night that Jack meets Lester Young um, in 1943. And they share a cab from the village up to Mittens where all the, you know, the, the bebop thing is percolating. All these guys are it, literally inventing it there um, moment to moment. And, um, Prez, as he was known, the president of the tenors, he produces something that Kerouac had never had before, which was marijuana. And um, it was a hugely important night in his life, really. Right, right. definitely, he, definitely. Uh, he passed him a funny little cigarette. Um, uh, I think that's before Lester Young was incarcerated. It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. So he was still riding high. Yeah. You know, I, I love the uh, epigraph, the general epigraph to your book, where you quote Kerouac, uh, uh, who says, what's the use of not being high? You mean you want to be low? 
I, I paraphrase it. I didn't quote yeah. it correctly. Yeah. Forgive me. Yeah. But, but I came as yeah. close as I could. That, that was the gist of it. That was, he, yeah. he said other things, and that, in that, that was from Visions of Cody, which was his most experimental work, really, um, which he wrote after On the Road. Well, you know, it is his most experimental work, but you know, On the Road exists in several different versions. Mm -hmm. We have what Kerouac called the cast-rated version. And the original version, which has also been published, is just as experimental mm -hmm. as Visions of Cody. But Visions of Cody is more tuned in to the, to the rhythm of jazz, yes. definitely. And it's fusion with marijuana and benzaprine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that, that was the thing that Kerouac brought to it, you know. I mean, uh, you know, you, you said at the beginning when you were playing around midnight that, but this is, this, this is a, a form that, that Kerouac really invented right in this neighborhood with a couple of musicians like David Amram, who's still alive uh, in his 80s uh, and still composing classically and uh, doing everything. He's an incredible person. Yeah. Uh, and a few other musicians like Zoot Sims and you know people who aren't here anymore. Uh, uh, but this fusion of poetry and jazz, you know, uh, is is something really that he he invents. You know, he 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 invents it at uh, the Village Vanguard on Seventh Avenue South when Max Gordon said, you know, why don't you come and rap for a few nights to the audience? And he, his friends were musicians; they were jazz musicians. A lot of them, and uh, that's why a few of them are willing to back him for nothing, just to be there. And he's doing haiku, and the thing about Kerouac is he could invent them spontaneously, anytime. And uh, the footnote to that is when he's interviewed by um, for the Paris Review magazine uh, uh, by two interviewers. Uh, Ted Berrigan, and another one. Uh, they were amazed at the way he, they would ask him a question, which they expected uh, an answer with psychology and epistemology and philosophy. He would come up with 17 syllables. Baffling. <laughs> yeah. that's, like, that's, like, that's like someone improvising on the horn. Exactly. You know, as he said, his model was Charlie Parker. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's so amazing that Parker dies on his 33rd birthday, yeah. Kerouac's 33rd birthday. Right, right. Well, he's in Mexico, and then he writes Mexico City Blues. He's writing Mexico City Blues, but people don't understand that when he was writing Mexico City Blues, he was living on the Mexico City Bowery and begging. He had a notebook, and he would write these, what he called, choruses. But he had experienced vagrancy in a way that no American writer had, you know, George Orwell tried to do it, but Orwell was doing it and he had a newspaper salary. It's like having a credit card in your back pocket mm -hmm. while you're sitting on the Bowery and begging. It's not quite the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I admire Orwell for even trying in writing down and out in London and Paris, but, but and Orwell's a great writer. I, I don't want to say anything negative about him, but what Kerouac did took real risk. Right. And it wasn't that he was trying to take a risk or looking for adventure. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you a question because... Um, I'm supposed to ask you the question. No, no, no. I want to know what you think about it. Kerouac was, had this incredible veneration for African American culture. Right. Um, there's, a, there's a moment in uh, On the Road um, where the character Sal Paradise is walking through Denver, right. and he's yearning to be black. He's, he's actually, you know, it actually says, you know, there, he just, he just, his race is just is it enough of the night, of, the, of all of this kind of stuff that he was looking for. And also joy. And joy and ecstasy. Right. And, um, and then, you know, later on in, in Desolation Angels, he says, you know, the Negro people will be the salvation of America. And I wanted you to just talk about that a little bit. Well, you know, that scene in On the Road uh, uh, in, in the black section of Denver was very controversial. 
when On the Road appeared. Uh, James Baldwin attacked it and said, you're romanticizing life in the ghetto. And none other than Eldridge Cleaver answered Baldwin by saying, at least this man sees us. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, and you know, Cleaver was a revolutionary. Uh, 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 not an Uncle Tom. No. Uh, um, yeah, Kerouac has this, you know, I think part of it is, you know, the, we, we don't understand that, that Jack Kerouac was from Quebec. That his first language is Joual, which is a uh, uh, patois, a French. And I, I spent a lot of my life in New England. And in New England, we call these people who will come down and do any kind of work, because the people in Quebec are so poor. Kerouac said he came from a line of potato farmers, which meant you had a thin gruel soup and a lot of vodka, which you made from the potato. And you basically subsisted on that. Uh, I mean, I know he was born in Lowell, Massachusetts, and I know there's this incredible monument to him in Lowell, which you should all uh, see sometime, because it's the most am ambitious. Uh, Dukakis put it up there. Uh, but the most ambitious uh, a monument to any writer I've seen on planet Earth so far, and I've been around. <laughs> uh, um, <clears throat> but in New England, people call the people from Quebec who come down to work les nègres blancs, the white niggers. So he identifies right. with the outsider, mm -hmm. totally. Totally. And I think that's the beginning of, of, of his, his response right. uh, mm -hmm. in a club like Minton's. When he was in Minton's, night after night, he was a white blip. Yeah. Okay? Right, <laughs> right. He was the only guy like him there. And, you know, he becomes real friends with Lester Young. Yeah. Less so with Charlie Parker, because Charlie Parker never got out of himself, basically, you know? Uh, uh, and, and to have a friend, you, you need to, you know, be more engaging. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But he has total reverence for Parker. Yeah. You know, yeah. Total admiration for Parker. Right. And that's why in Mexico City Blues, there are two poems about Charlie Parker. Right, right. Um, I remember uh, when I was doing the research for th this book and my previous book, Can't Find My Way Home, I had occasion to uh, talk to uh, Kerouac's first wife, Edie Kerouac Parker, and she told me this wonderful story of um, a night at uh, Minton's, and Kerouac loved uh, Billie Holiday too, and she used to sit at the table with them, and his favorite, his favorite song was I Cover the Waterfront, and she said when, she, when, when Lady would sit down at the table, he would just, he would just glow, I just absolutely glow. And she described, I mean, how he was, you know, he would smoke pot and he would just completely go into the music. And, you know, he'd stay in there. And then at one point he would open up his eyes and, uh, you know, of course she said he had the saddest, most beautiful blue eyes ever. And um, in a way, that was what so many other people would do when they picked up marijuana and discovered jazz. Mm -hmm. So in a way he was kind of like these, so many of these characters, and this is why I wrote about them, were forerunners of really what became, you know, known in the 60s as, uh, you know, the American counterculture. Mm -hmm. And um, even though, you know, when Kerouac got older, you know, he had very little use for hippies and counterculture and stuff like that. But they claimed him as theirs. You know, they had read On the Road and just had awakenings in his beautiful prose. And, you know, he was theirs. Well, you know, in On the Road, when he describes jazz session after jazz session after jazz session, that he and Dean are in these clubs just listening and, and grooving and, and moving, you know? To that sound, uh, uh, that's extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. And I totally um, get the whole 
obsession with uh, you know African American music. You know, I feel exactly the same way. You know, it goes back to when I was a little boy, and my house they had Nat King Cole and uh, Dinah Washington, and you know we had other music too. But I would listen to those voices, and they somehow sounded different. They were like. Um, I'll use a carnivorous uh, analogy. I hope I don't offend the vegans. Um, to, to me, they sounded like a, like a delicious roast, you know, in some rich gravy, you know. And um, and I would think, it's a, you know, I, the, the gravy, where the gravy come from? What made it so rich? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the black musical tradition. You know, when you mentioned a moment ago about uh, uh, Billie Holiday sharing the table with uh, Edie Parker uh, and Jack Kerouac, Edie Parker being his first wife, um, um, that's one of the things I like so much about your book is that you find these moments to focus on because they tell us so much. Like you have a scene there where uh, Parker, 16 years old, uh, 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 is listening to Lester Young, I believe, in Kansas City. At the Club Reno. Yeah, yeah. And uh, th th that's, th that shows a real narrative gift. And uh, uh, you to be really commended for that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's very gracious of you. Um, are, are we on to the Q&A? How much time is left? Oh, wow, we have... Uh, it's, is it 7.30, really? Still? Yeah. Wow, we have a whole half hour, dude. Well, we can do the Q&A, too. You know? No, let's keep talking. We can mix it up anyway. Let, let's keep talking. What's your question? Can you talk a little bit about the character of Harry Anslinger in your book? Oh, yeah. Um, one of the things about the book that, was, um, that really kind of drove me to write it was, um, you know, marijuana shows up on the streets of New Orleans around 1910, which is right around the time that jazz is coalescing. So they really kind of um, move together um, as, as it evolves and as it kind of moves into the culture. And simultaneous to that, of course, is the beginning of the entire regime of drug prohibitionism um, the drug laws and, you know, drug enforcement as we have come to know it in the modern age. And the man who was basically the overseer of all of it was uh, Harry Jacob Anslinger, who was the head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics for 30 years. He was in there as long as J. Edgar Hoover was running the FBI. And this man single-handedly, like, established the template for everything that became what we would know as the drug war and, and, and also the culture war over drugs. Um, and in the beginning, it was undeniably um, racist in terms of um, a lot of the uh, motivations behind it. Uh, there was um, an incredible amount of fear that, that were dri was driving it, um, not only the first marijuana law, but also the Harrison Narcotic Act of um, 1914, you know, that, uh, that outlawed um, heroin and also, at the time, cocaine. Um, so it was, uh, it, it's kind of like a parallel na narrative that I, that I follow in the book of as one thing is growing in our culture, in our society, this other thing is growing that is trying to stop it. And, uh, you know, it's a classically American story in a way. And so much of what's happening today um, I see as a living history of what began in this period. You know, we see six states with legal recreational marijuana use, the whole West Coast, you can smoke pot. Um, that comes from this period. And Allen, 
Allen was really the man who began the movement in the United States to legalize marijuana. He and a handful of few others. Um, the well, Allen also, you know, did more than anyone to change American attitudes towards homosexuality. There's a uh, famous shot that the photographer Richard Avedon took of Allen and uh, Peter Orlovsky embracing. Uh, that was on every lamppost, or many lampposts, Xeroxes, uh, of San Francisco in the early 60s. And uh, that was a catalyst mm -hmm. moment. Um, uh, but certainly, uh, Alan was unafraid. Uh, uh, you know, you were talking about Anslinger, however, and, and Anslinger, you characterize him correctly as a xenophobic racist. Uh, Hoover was too, but um, uh, uh, Burroughs would tell you that a person like Anslinger has to invent a need to justify the existence of himself and his bureau. Right. And that is the beginning of the drug war. Right. To justify that need based on fear. Okay, based on fear. <laughs> the enemy is coming. And we've got to protect ourselves. And the enemy was, in this case, Mexican laborers, um, African American jazz musicians and laborers, and of course, American bohemians um, who were experimenting. One footnote, though. Okay. One footnote. Uh, 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 two summers ago, up in my second home state of Vermont, uh, I went to the neighboring town of Castleton. These towns have been around for a couple of hundred years, since the middle of the 18th century. And uh, Castleton has old, homestead, old home day, and they open up certain old dwellings. And I went to the doctor's house and because uh, I have some little reputation as a historian, they let me go into the doctor's private office and examine his logbook. And every third patient, and I looked at the logbook, and it, I must have looked at 100 entries or 150 entries for patients. Every third patient was being administered with opium. Well, Anslinger must not have known about that. <laughs> okay? Um, <clears throat> the playwright Eugene O'Neill certainly did because his mother was a morphine addict. Right, right. Um, it's so interesting, you know, all these waves of heroin. Um, you know, they're always labeled epidemics because we do that reflexively. But they're, what they really are are waves that come and go. And um, you know some of them, the, some of the waves are bigger than others, um, but they always seem to subside eventually. And um, you know there, you can see one in the 1920s, and um, that was when they started the laws against. Uh, there were a lot of people who were addicted to opiates who, uh, when they were cut off, um, had no choice but to try to get something through the underground. So it was the drug law that actually began the drug underground. You, you in your book, uh, uh, have a, uh, a scene with uh, Herbert Hunky, who may be the grandfather of the American underground, certainly in terms of the beats. Yeah. Because uh, uh, it was Herbert who introduces uh, Burroughs to that world. Right. You know, and in Junkie, uh, uh, Burroughs is going to rent an apartment on Henry Street for Hunky with the, prov with the provision that he can drop in at any time and stay. But Burroughs is paying the rent. He had an allowance, a family allowance. He right. could afford it. Right. Rent wasn't very high anyway. Yeah, they were fascinated with Hunky because, you know, he was like some sort of guide to a new underground that they, you know, were, were just like You know who was also by. fascinated with Hunky? Alfred Kinsey. Alfred Kinsey uh, comes to uh, New York City. He, he was a biologist. He taught at Indiana University for 25 years, and he was bored with studying the sexual habits of the gall wasp. Uh, 
and he decided that now it's time to study the sexual habits of humans. And, uh, uh, but Kinsey himself was very shy <laughs> and afraid. And, uh, but he, uh, he has his graduate student approach this very furtive, strange looking man who's prowling around Times Square. And it's Herbert Hunky who becomes his chief, his first recruiter. Hunky goes and finds subjects for him. Yeah. And Hunky gets a reward for each subject that he brings in for another interview that Kinsey would do. Kinsey would end up doing thousands of interviews all over the country. And of course he takes the money and goes right out and scores dope. <laughs> you know, Hunky did a lot of disreputable things. He stole overcoats. Uh, he stole, you know, he was never violent, but, but he would steal. Yeah, you know? yeah. And he was a hustler. He was a hustler. He was a hustler. Um, and he was, was the man who first put the word beat in what became known as the Beat Generation. Right, that's where Kerouac gets the term. Yeah, and, and it would evolve over the years to, you know, to mean different things. All of them were fascinated by Herbert Hunky. Uh, Kerouac, uh, Burroughs, Ginsburg, all of them. They were, they were totally fascinated by this, uh, this, this, this man who would run away from his Chicago home at 15 and join the circus and wandered around as on a, the road. As a teenage heroin addict yeah, in, in right. depression era right. America. Right. Now, you know, Herbert lived in, into his 80s and he was still in that. I know. Yeah. Yeah, I was very lucky to be able to spend time with him for, uh, for my books. Um, and he was a great storyteller. Oh, yeah. And the world of his stories was the world of illicit drugs. And um, he knew more about them than, than anyone. And he was a he was a like a, a raconteur, and um, you know when Ginsburg and Kerouac were young, you know still college students, they would go look for him, you know in these Times Square cafeterias just because they knew that he would sit down over a cup of coffee and just fascinate them with right. his stories. Right. That's really cool. Yeah, just as quickly. Uh, uh, and you already alluded to this. Uh, with, it's, it's about Kerouac. You alluded to it when you mentioned that, like later in life, when he sort of disavowed the beats and so forth. Just wondering for both of you, what happened to Kerouac? What, what, what? Why did he end up like a right winger, living with his mom? I think like in Florida, alcoholic, and it just—I mean—it seemed like a dramatic sort of change from from the milieu or whatever that he had that he'd been in, that Ginsburg didn't do, that you know, none of the you know, boroughs were certainly kind of stayed true to whatever it was they were. Yeah. John, you want to take that? Uh, poor Jack was poisoned by life, by fame, by alcohol, by his mother, with whom he lived most of his life, who, you know, Burroughs characterizes uh, Mimere as uh, uh, a stupid, ignorant peasant. And Burroughs was right on. He, he knew what he was saying. Uh, uh, but because Kerouac was bound to her emotionally, okay, that you, and if it's a poisonous relationship, you know, uh, he was withered by life. You know, he burned out early. Uh, I think alcohol had a lot to do with it. And the, uh, the dangers of fame. You know, but you, you quote Diane de Prima in your book uh, uh, about how sometimes downfall can be tragic and sublime. And in Kerouac's case, I think there's some of that. Yeah. Um, uh, you also quote de Prima very effectively when she says that their God was consciousness and uh, using drugs allowed them to see the maze in which we're all walking. I yeah. mean, I'm paraphrasing it. Yeah. And, and wildly. Yeah. Uh, uh, I should have <laughs> memorized it because it's so good. Um, when I think of uh, Kerouac at the end, um, <clears throat> I personally see uh, a tragic alcoholic in the truest sense. Um, and, you know, I think that his alcoholism progressed from when he was disappointed when he couldn't get his book published for five years um, and it just got worse and then it it got worse when he got his book published and he became famous 
And then when he got older, I mean, look, um, I, I love Kerouac, but he breaks my heart. Um, there are passages in his book, Big Sur, that are about, you know, the, just the, the pain, the soul pain of an alcoholic and how he you know, like yearns for redemption. And it's beautiful writing, um, and I don't think anyone's described it better, but it's shattering. And that's, I think, that was his truth, I think. I have another question. My, <laughs> wife, my <laughs> wife always has a lot of questions. No, no, you've talked a lot about all the guys of this era. What I love about your book is you spend so much time also focusing on some of the women, in particular Billie Holiday, and also the pseudonymous character of, um, you know, I forget the pseudonym now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I call her uh, Ruby Rosano in the right. book. Um, I knew I had to write about Billie Holiday, and so much has been written about her. So much that's completely not based in any, anything, you know. And what I wanted to do was to um, write about her as an artist, write about her as a person, but also write about her addiction in a way um, that was real and humanized it. And um, I found, I was very fortunate to find a woman who uh, had been a heroin addicted prostitute um, in the 1950s in New York, who would go to uh, this uh, sub basement. Uh, it was actually a shooting gallery, but it was an apartment. And a lot of the jazz musicians would fall by there. And um, so she would use drugs with Billie Holiday. And, there was, there, there, and the, a bond formed between them, uh, it, more in, in Ruby's mind because, I mean, her life is unbelievable. If you, if you read the book, you'll see it's just mind-boggling what this woman went through. Um, but that's how I, I, I could do it. I mean, I could show a kind of a different side of that story, and she, she enabled me to do that, um, which I'm grateful for. You know, I, I could just add one thing, and that is, the Beats are known as an all-boy gang, but there were a lot of girls in that group. And they're only beginning to get the recognition that they deserve. Uh, I have a new book coming out in a couple of months, and part of that is devoted to a woman named Bonnie Bremser, who was married to one of the, uh, one of Kerouac's uh, Beat buddies, Ray Bremser. Ray Bremser wrote his first two books in jail. Uh, and Bonnie had a really hard time of it, but she wrote a classic account of their marriage called For Love of Ray. And she's pretty much obscured in history as many of the girls were at that time, but we need to know that they existed and that they did some really profound things, oh, particularly yeah. Bonnie. <laughs> oh yeah, like uh, Diane de Prima. I mean, oh, yeah. these women, um, if you think the men were um, bold in terms of like being um, cultural experimenters, the women had to be even bolder. Oh yeah, Diana takes a bath with Jack and Al together. So I mean, that's pretty bold. <laughs> it is for many reasons. <laughs> And I had a, the privilege of, of reading, reading it before probably everyone else. But um, I, I wanted you to elaborate a bit on the chapter that you did on Charlie Parker. I was particularly moved uh, with that chapter. And um, he had so much talent, and yet there were s such self-defeating patterns that he was repeating over and over. I wonder if you can elaborate a little bit on that. Charlie. Um, uh, Charlie Parker, the of course, everyone called him Bird. Um, he was the conduit of heroin into uh, the jazz scene. And the reason it happened was because he was so brilliant. I mean, he was just this ingenious, natural musician and innovator. 
And he was also a natural born drug addict. I mean, there are some of us who have just, for whatever reason, genetic, whatever makeup, um, we are just um, predisposed to addiction. And Charlie Parker was clearly one of them. So he got addicted for the first time at the age of 16 when he was a teenager in Kansas City before he even went on the road and, and had his career. So his entire ascent um, is fused with drugs. And fueled. Yes, and fueled by it. And the, and the other musicians were blown away by him because he would, you know, I mean, he was unbelievable. He would spend a whole day in a hotel room, you know, with a reefer dangling from his lip, drinking a quart of whiskey, you know, with a woman in between his legs filleting him and jacking heroin into a vein. And then, you know, he would get on a stage and put the horn to his lips and stuff would come out that would blow people away. And somehow it just, he was able to, it, it would pass through his brain and his nervous system and his heart and his soul. And these guys, these young guys who were coming up in the jazz scene would look at it and go, holy shit, how does he do that? And it had a huge impact on them and their own attitudes about these substances. Um, so that by 1950, you see something that had never really happened before, which is all you know of the major young modern jazz artists addicted to heroin, just like Bergen. And um, one of the things that I do in, the, in my book is I show what happens to them as they pass through the whole phenomena of it. And, you know, they're, they're all very different stories. I mean, I, I read about how Miles kicked, you know, and, you know, and, 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 and but Miles, he, in, in a way, he kind of stayed inside himself. Uh, you know, he, he never really healed, in a way. He kind of put whatever it was that was in that hole, he put style in there and his brilliance and, you know, his, his women and his art. Um, and then there was Coltrane. What happened to Coltrane was fascinating because after this scene, he takes a nosedive. I mean, he is really plummeting as this is happening. And Miles has to kick him out of his band. And what happens is he goes and he tries to kick dope. All of them tried to kick over and over again. Um, and um, he failed. But, you know, they would hear him on stage as he's withdrawing from heroin, you know, playing this unbelievable stuff. And then he went home to his mother's house and he locked himself in a room and he told everyone he wasn't going to come out for like two weeks until he was clean. And sometime during that experience, he had, you know, uh, a spiritual awakening. You know, he, he accessed whatever he referred to it as his God. You know, he writes about it in the liner notes of uh, A Love Supreme. And, you know, that changed his life. Um, and from that moment on, he was a different man and a different artist. And, you know, his whole life was about spirituality and, um, you know, showering people with his love through his music and, you know, exalting the interconnected sacredness of everything. And he was just unbelievable. Um, and then there's a guy in, in my book, uh, Jackie McLean, great saxophonist, who was a protege of Charlie Parker. And he could never get clean, no matter what he did, you know, no matter what he did. And there were a lot of guys like that. And eventually he um, found uh, Dr. Marie Nicewander, who developed the methadone program. And he was able to use methadone as exactly what she was designing it for, which was a bridge back to a normal life. And then he became a professor of music at, um, yeah? some of these artists' lives. In other words, did they see it as a way to fuel their 
creativity. For well, Jackie was playing yet. He said it was stage fright. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. said, you know, it's his fear of performance yeah. is what led him to heroin. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But uh, an exception to all this was Dizzy Gillespie, right? Oh, yeah. There, there were, all, yeah. There were a lot of drugs, exceptions. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Dizzy, uh, Louis Armstrong, you know, right. what, the first prototypical great jazz pothead. You know, never, he was violently opposed to hard drugs and, yeah. and, and excessive drinking. And as a result, you know, never, ever crossed that line. And Dizzy was very much like that. You know, he was a man of great largesse and, you know, he was a genial smoker of marijuana. And, um, you know, it was devastating to him what he saw happening around him. You know, the myth is that marijuana is the gateway drug, but actually it's alcohol. And it has been for a couple of thousand years. <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> Mingus was clean too, right? Yes, Mingus never became a drug addict. Um, there were, you know, um, uh, um, there were a number of guys. I mean, there's a jazz historian named Lincoln Collier who uh, did a rough estimation that during the 1940s and 50s, like from the period of 47 to 57, 75 percent of jazz musicians were using heroin, which is really astounding when you think about it. And how the hell did they create this classic American music, you know, while they were all strung out like that? And I think that one of the things was um, the saxophonist uh, Dexter Gordon was uh, told uh, Ira Gittler, a uh, jazz critic, when he was doing an oral history of jazz, he said, really, you were playing your lifestyle. So in a way, that was what was happening. They were playing their lifestyle. And in a way, the Beats were, you know, writing their lifestyle. Well, you know, what's interesting about this is the way in which any drug, whether it's just cup after cup of coffee or any drug, affects an artist's creativity. And with the Beats, there's no question about it. You yeah. know, with Kerouac, with Burroughs, it becomes his subject, his exclusive subject. Uh, uh, Ginsburg uh, writes uh, the second section of Hal on peyote. <laughs> uh, uh, right before uh, he begins the uh, second section of Hal, at the very end, part one, he alludes to the wild saxophone cry of the absolute heart of life. And, and uh, uh, yeah, th 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 these substances clearly inspired and fueled some of their effort. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that during this period, you know, I had occasion to um, film Alan at the uh, uh, Woodstock Festival of uh, 1994, I think it was, and we were talking about marijuana, and he said something that was really interesting. He said, you know, when he was a college student in, uh, at Columbia in the 1940s, he was the only one who would be stoned, like on the whole campus. You know, he, as he referred to it, you know, uh, you know, I was the only one in that population of 20,000 <laughs> intelligent scholars who was in that particular state of mind. <laughs> And then by the 1970s, he saw 30 million people in America smoking pot. And, and I asked him, I said, well, what do you think about that? And he said, um, you know, um, I, I never really thought that people would use pot just for kicks. To me, it was always about mindfulness. It was always about some ex applying experience. And an expansion, of consciousness. an expansion of consciousness, and I never, and so he never really imagined that, you know, there were going to be a, a generation of kids in the 70s who were going to smoke pot and like, you know, basically eat Dorito chips and watch television. <laughs> or go to the mall. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and it was really like, to, to him that was like a really uncomfortable irony. 
um, about the whole kind of arc of the thing. Yes, you mentioned about the uh, them playing their li you know uh, the art was their uh, partly their lifestyle or this, or ta uh, content of it. Do you to what extent do you think the illicit nature of drugs at that time contributed to the art and should Anslinger get some credit for the art? <laughs> In other words, is Harry Anslinger responsible for On the Road? <laughs> uh, wow. I think the fact that this stuff had to happen underground um, was definitely an important part of it. So all these people commingled um, who, you know, I mean, there was no other place in society for them to, to do that. Um, I mean, what's so fascinating about jazz and the story of jazz culture is you know, you look at a place like the Savoy Ballroom in Harlem in the 1930s, and this is, you know, even before marijuana was illegal in 1937, you know, after this massive, crazy reefer madness campaign. But it was really the one place in America where black kids and white kids could actually fraternize and dance together and talk and have an authentic exchange. And it was a place where jazz was happening, and it was a place where marijuana was happening. And so this, the culture, this viper culture, you know, I mean, and then it became illegal. And, you know, in a way, what that did was it declared war on that underground. It was like a declaration of war. You know, it was a war declared by, uh, you know, um, conservative white America against other people who were going to embrace the use of these substances. And I think that dynamic really plays an important part on, in many things, the arts being one of them. Whoa, we went over. That, la that last half hour passed really fast. Yeah. Um, well, we are sliding right into home, so thank you so much, uh, John, for being here, and Martin for writing this book. Thank you so much.